In this video, I am going to do a solo run with Typhlosion and with Charizard to see which one can beat Pokemon Crystal the fastest. Now here's an interesting fact about these two. They actually have the exact same base stats. And I don't mean base stat total, I mean the exact same base stats. 78 HP, 84 attack, 78 defense, 109 special attack, 85 special defense, and 100 speed. I'm really not sure what the developers were thinking when they designed these two. Why did they just copy and paste the stats? It's so weird. So now let's look at some of the factors that actually distinguish the two from each other. First of all is typing. Typhlosion is a mono fire type, whereas Charizard gets the secondary flying typing. Previously with Venusaur and Meganium, the additional type both ended up being an advantage and a disadvantage during certain battles. And today I can see that being the case for Charizard as well. While the flying type gives an immunity to ground, which is very useful as a fire type, it does also increase my weakness to rock, making it a 4 time weakness. However, luckily for Charizard, there aren't any prominent rock type specialists in these games. After all, Brock is in Kanto and all of the gym leaders there are quite easy. The flying type does also give a weakness to electric, but this is also a Kanto gym leader and there aren't many prominent hard hitting electric moves throughout the playthrough. Okay, so now let's talk about moves. Typhlosion starts with Ember, Leer, Smokescreen, and Tackle. Through level up, it gets Flame Wheel at level 31, which is a really cool sounding move. Then it learns Swift, and later Flamethrower, all the way at level 60. So it only gets access to normal type and fire type moves. However, through TMs and HMs, it gets access to a lot more. Dynamic Punch, Rollout, Iron Tail, Dig, Mud Slap, Fire Blast, Thunder Punch, Fire Punch, Fury Cutter, which is kind of weird, and then through HMs it gets Cut and Strength, and through the Move Tutor it can learn Flamethrower. As a mono fire type it is weak to ground, rock, and water. And in the case of Typhlosion, its move pool gives coverage against two of these types. I have ground moves for rock type Pokemon and an electric move for water type Pokemon. Luckily for me, ground does not resist fire, so I'm just going to be able to hit those Pokemon with its powerful stab moves anyways. Before we get to Charizard's move pool, let's talk about Typhlosion's early game. Access to a stab move in the form of Ember is great for sweeping most of these Pokemon, and Tackle gives me damage against Pokemon that resist Ember. By the way, there aren't very many of these in Crystal, it's essentially only the rival's Totodile, which is no problem because you can just level up before that fight. Also, I am starting the game with a fully evolved Pokemon, which clearly gives me an advantage. I recorded this playthrough a while ago, so I am going to go throughout Sprout Tower and get some quick experience here by finishing off all the Bellsprout with Ember. With the Sage out of the way, my Typhlosion is level 14, and while I head back to Faulkner's Gym and fight the trainers there, I want to mention the nickname that I chose. When I was a kid, I had a hamster and it was kind of an orangey red color, and uh, yeah, I named it Sunflower, so today my Typhlosion is nicknamed in memory of her. Alright, so we've made it to Faulkner, let's do this. The main fear that I have in this battle is that Mudslap is going to get out of control too quickly. The AI in Generation 2 chooses its moves based on which one is going to do the most damage, and because my Typhlosion is a fire type and the Pidgey's only other move is Tackle, it is going to spam Mudslap. However, Ember just knocks it out in one hit. I level up to 15, and then Faulkner sends in his ace, Pidgeotto, which I've been thinking about recently, and he could have caught this in Viridian Forest in like yellow version. I sort of think that it's cool that it's level 9 just because of that, but overall this is usually a pretty underwhelming ace, and today that's really the case because it has Gust. This does more damage than Mudslap, so it's never going to lower my accuracy, and because of that, Typhlosion takes an easy victory. It's time to jump over to Charizard and check out its move pool. When comparing with Typhlosion, this thing gets an eerily similar starting four moves. Scratch, Growl, Ember, and Smokescreen. Of these moves, I want to mention the difference between Scratch and Tackle. In Generation 2, Scratch is base 40 power and it has 100% accuracy, whereas Tackle is base 35 power and only has 95% accuracy. So in the early portions of the game, it's really nice when you have Scratch and you don't have Tackle. So that's a small advantage for Charizard. Through 
through level up, it gets some moves that are not going to be useful like Rage and Scary Face, but then it gets Flamethrower at level 34, which if you remember is much sooner than Typhlosion. That thing gets it at level 60. Quickly after learning this fantastic move, it learns Wing Attack only two levels higher at level 36. From there, things quickly go downhill. We have Slash. It's not going to be as useful as Return by that point in the game. Then we have Dragon Rage, which is fixed damage, and Fire Spin, which basically is just a waste of time, especially when it has 70% accuracy. Through TMs and HMs, Charizard gets access to pretty much all of the things that Typhlosion does, with a few notable exceptions. It learns Dragon Breath, which makes sense, just look at Charizard. It also learns Fly, but I don't think that move's going to see play today, just because it has 70 base power, and when compared with Wing Attack, I think that the move that takes only one one turn is going to be more useful to speed run the game. Finally, and most notably, is the fact that Charizard only learns Fire Punch, it cannot learn Thunder Punch, and that does mean that it has no coverage for water type Pokemon. Oh also, it does learn Steel Wing, but you get it in Kanto and I can't see it being particularly useful. So now, with Sprout Tower out of the way, and my Charizard being level 14, let's go into the battle against Faulkner. And this one is going to be much easier, because as a flying type, he can't even hit me with Mud Slap, so the main fear that I had with Typhlosion is just not relevant in this battle. I one-shot the Pidgey, and then I two-shot the Pidgeotto, earning myself the first badge very quickly. By the way, this badge gives a 12.5% boost to my Pokemon's attack stat, and it also gives a 12.5% boost to all moves that are flying type. For Charizard, this is going to be very helpful throughout the playthrough, but I am going to have to wait for level 36 in order to make use of this boost. Now it's time for me to make some upgrades to Charizard's moveset. First of all, I can teach Mud Slap in the place of Growl, and then in Union Cave, I head to the bottom floor where I pick up TM39, which is Swift, and I teach this move in the place of Smokescreen. In the past, I've kept this kind of move on my set for way too long, and it ends up usually being a mistake because I haven't really had a challenge where Smokescreen has been useful, other than like coughing in Pokemon Yellow, but like that is a completely different scenario than when I have a Charizard. Okay, so now I have to head outside of Union Cave, and here, waiting for me, is Hiker Anthony. I was figuring that he was going to spin out of the way, but he just keeps looking down and catches me, which is actually really annoying, because the first Geodude does know Rock Throw, which does four times damage to Charizard. Here, I had a choice to make between either Ember or Mud Slap. Because Geodude's special defense is significantly worse than its physical defense, I go for Ember. It could also burn, which would cut Rock Throw's damage, but it doesn't. Geodude goes for Rock Throw. It hits, doing massive damage to Charizard, but I survive with orange health. Charizard heals itself a little bit with a berry, and then I knock the Geodude out on the next turn with Ember. Okay, so all that's left is a Machop, and it's pretty easy to clean up. So now I'm moving on to the Rocket Plot line in Slowpoke Well. Honestly, let's just jump ahead through this battle animation to the battle against the ace rocket. He has a single coughing. Its level is actually unusually high for a Johto trainer Pokemon, but Charizard's Ember is doing massive damage and so it isn't an issue. And with him out of the way, it is now time to head into Bugsy's gym and take on the second gym leader. So I expect this battle to be extremely easy. With Meganium I had huge problems against Bugsy's Scyther because it knows Fury Cutter, but in this case I have a double resistance to that move, so the Scyther is just going to be spamming Quick Attack, and yeah that move is not doing very much damage. I knock Bugsy's Ace out, at this point I have a chance to learn Rage, which I might as well teach in the place of Scratch. This move is not nearly as bad as it is in Generation 1 by the way. After that Bugsy sends out his final Pokemon which is a Kakuna, I one shot it with Ember, and I've earned myself the second badge. So far so good, this is a really refreshing start for Charizard. After all, this thing wasn't very good in Pokemon Yellow when I did it a long time ago. Maybe it's gonna earn some redemption for itself today in Generation 2. Okay, so let's fight the rival outside of Azalea Town. He's got a Ghastly. Normally I'm a little bit scared of this thing, but I can just use Ember to one-shot it. After that he sends in Croconaw, and Swift is my best move against it, but it looks like it's doing less than a third. However, here's the thing, when the rival chooses Totodile as his starter, his best water type move for the rest of the playthrough is Water Gun, and it is not doing very much to Charizard. I finish his ace off, all that's left is Zubat, which doesn't outspeed me so it can't flinch with Bite, and because of that I'm able to easily take a victory. Okay, so now there are a lot of errands to take care of. First of all, I'm going to grab the free charcoal after rescuing Farfetch'd. Then in the forest, I grab the TM for Headbutt, which I guess I'm just going to teach in the place of Rage right away, so I might as well have not learned that move. 
Next, I head towards Goldenrod City, fighting Todd along my way. I just don't like to have to dodge him through the patch of grass twice during the playthrough. After all, I am going to want to backtrack through this route later in the game when I have Surf so that I can get an extra rare candy. In the department store, I buy the TM for Fire Punch, which I teach to Charizard in the place of Ember. So I am going to do a bunch of the regular Goldenrod errands now. We'll just skip ahead to when I'm talking to Floria on the route by Sudowoodo. I do this first, and then I head into the National Park. Here, I'm going to collect the TM for Dig, which is going to be a great upgrade for Mud Slap. And this TM is coming at the perfect moment in the playthrough, which I will explain in a second. For now, let's roll the Whitney intro. Up first is Clefairy. I just hope that I'm going to one-shot this thing so it doesn't have a chance to get like rock slide with metronome. Yes, Fire Punch gets the one hit. So now it is time to move on to the mill tank. And I just previously teased the fact that Dig is the perfect move right now in this playthrough. And that is so I can break Rollout's combo, preventing it from stacking up damage. However, it looks like Charizard is just powerful enough to two-shot the mill tank. So I don't even have to worry about Rollout gaining power. And I can take an easy victory over the third gym leader. So theoretically Charizard's flying typing is a weakness against Whitney, but it didn't prove to be the case. So going back to Typhlosion's playthrough, I expect that it should keep pace throughout this section of the game. After all, there are basically no major differences. I can still pick up Swift in Union Cave, Bugsy has a bunch of Pokemon that are just terrible against these fire types. Remember my stats are identical, so I am dealing basically the same amount of damage in all these battles. Things start to change against the rival. You'll notice that I am a lower level with Typhlosion than I was with Charizard. You might think this is because I'm playing Typhlosion second and I cut some training intentionally out. It's actually not the case. I played this Typhlosion playthrough before I played the Charizard playthrough. A small piece of evidence is that I hung on to Smokescreen here, whereas with Charizard, I deleted that move. Now, this battle specifically is not bad because of the Croconaw. It's because of the Zubat. I can't believe I'm saying that. Ember almost knocks it out. I get hit by Supersonic. Typhlosion hits itself. I get hit by Bite, which scores a critical hit. Then Typhlosion hits itself again. Bite connects, and all I'm left with is 10 hit points. Okay, if I hit myself again, I'm going to lose this battle. So in the moment of truth, will Typhlosion hit? And in this case, it does. And now as I head into Goldenrod City and go to the department store, I want to talk about Flame Wheel. In Generation 2, I thought that the only Pokemon that could learn this move was the Typhlosion line. However, that isn't the case. Growlithe and Arcanine also get access to this move through level up, and Ponyta gets access to it through breeding, and Rattata gets access to it through breeding. That one is really weird. Anyways, other Pokemon can learn it, but the main place you're going to see it if you're playing Pokemon Crystal is on Typhlosion. At base 60 power and 100% accuracy, this move is quite good. However, the fact that Typhlosion can just learn Fire Punch from TM as soon as it gets to Goldenrod City means that we're not going to be seeing Flame Wheel in today's video. Also at this time, I pick up the TM for Thunder Punch, which I'm going to teach in the place of Swift, and then I head to the National Park, pick up the TM for Dig, and after teaching it to Typhlosion, my moveset is quite good. Fire Punch, Dig, Thunder Punch, and Headbutt. All of this is obviously going to be more than enough to defeat Whitney. I one-shot the Clefairy with Fire Punch. Next is the Mill Tank. I don't have a double weakness to roll out, so I'm really not scared here. Mill Tank just goes for Stomp, doing about a quarter, and I finish it off with Typhlosion's second hit. And now with her badge, my Pokemon get a 12.5% boost to their speed stat, as well as a 12.5% boost to all normal type moves. You can see this reflected in Headbutt's effective power in the top left. Its base power is 70, and with the 12.5% boost, it is now 78. Okay, so let's head north of the city and take on the Sudowoodo. In all my first playthroughs, I require myself to knock this thing out. I forgot to heal going into the battle, so I'm a little bit bruised. Dig does less than half. Sudowoodo hits Rock Throw. Okay, it's lucky that I am a mono fire type. I go for Dig again. I must have rolled better damage because it takes the Sudowoodo down. I head into Ecritic City, then backtrack to pick up the Magnet. After that, I defeat the Kimono Girls, getting access to Surf, and then I head towards Olivine City. I want to collect the Mint Berry as well as a Nugget here, and then I head to the Lighthouse where I can defeat more mandatory trainers before I head back to Ecritic City and take on the rival in Burned Tower. For Typhlosion, I have everything I need against his team. Dig takes care of the Haunter, Thunder Punch takes care of the Croconaw, as well as the following Zubat, and all that's left is Magnemite, which I can just simply Fire Punch. With this battle finished, I can now head into Ecritique Gym and take on Morty. Music 
Going into this fight, I think that I was a bit overconfident because I am not holding a mint berry. What I figured was that Typhlosion was going to be doing enough damage with Dig just to sweep through this fight. I do manage to take out his first two ghosts in a single hit each, and that allows me to completely bypass one of the main reasons that I could lose this fight, which is Curse. In retrospect, if they had survived and used Curse, it would have been really bad because I have to use Dig against the Gengar, and it just barely doesn't knock it out. Then it hits Hypnosis, putting Typhlosion to sleep, and uh, now I'm going to take damage from Dream Eater, which actually gets a critical hit, taking me to just above half health. Typhlosion continues to sleep, I take another Dream Eater into the orange, I sleep an additional turn, Gengar takes me down to red health, then Typhlosion wakes up, hits Dig, and knocks Morty's ace out. But his second Haunter is level 23, which is two levels higher than the first one, so I'm wondering if it's going to survive my Dig. But it doesn't, and with that, I've earned myself the fourth badge. Now instead of continuing with Typhlosion, we're going to head back to Charizard, because I really want to see how the pseudo Wudo battle is going to go. I'm really scared for Rock Throw here. Charizard's Dig does more than half, pseudo Wudo goes for Low Kick, which makes very little sense. Remember, this thing doesn't have any AI, it's just randomly using moves. So because of that, I'm able to take it out and continue with the playthrough. In this part of the game, I'm going to mirror the exact same approach I took with Typhlosion. So after the Lighthouse, I'm going to head back to Burn Tower and face the Rival. And this is the perfect moment to check in with Charizard's moveset, because it is not nearly as good as Typhlosion's. I have Fire Punch, Dig, Swift, and Headbutt. Still, for this fight, I have what I need. I can use Headbutt against the Croconaw for decent damage. It does just more than half, also causing a flinch, and so I'm able to take it out without taking any damage from Water Gun. Next, he sends in Magnemite. I made a mistake here. I was going for Dig because I thought it has four times damage, but Fire Punch would actually do slightly more just because I am holding the Charcoal. However, this doesn't really have any impact on the fight. I knock out the following Zubat, and with that, Charizard is ready for Morty. So remember, I played Typhlosion first, and in this case, I am not forgetting my Mint Berry with Charizard. I also figured that Fire Punch was going to one-hit the Ghastly, and that way I wouldn't have to take two turns with Dig to knock it out. Next is Haunter. I go for Dig here for a little bit more damage to polish it off, and now it's time to face the Gengar. Dig almost gets the one-hit, Charizard wakes itself up with its Berry, and I knock Morty's Ace out with Fire Punch on the next turn. All that's left is Haunter. Dig secures the one hit, and with that, the Flaming Lizard has made it past the fourth gym. And I think this is a good moment to check in with the times that the Pokemon are getting. So Typhlosion beat Morty with a time of 28 minutes and 25 seconds, whereas Charizard had a time of 27 minutes and 21 seconds. So Charizard, our Kanto starter, is in the lead by 1 minute and 4 seconds. Because of how similar these playthroughs have been, I really think that this lead comes down to the fact that I am playing Charizard second. I'm just a little bit more warmed up, and I have a better sense for exactly how I can optimize the overworld rooting. However, starting right now when Charizard reaches level 34, it's starting to get some major advantages over Typhlosion. The first one is the fact that it learns Flamethrower, which is a great replacement for Fire Punch. And then at level 36, it is going to get Wing Attack. However, as you can see, when I defeat all the trainers in Chuck's Gym, my Charizard is still half a level away from this goal. Because I didn't want to waste time backtracking, heading out to the sea and fighting a couple additional trainers, I just decided to go into Chuck at this level. Maybe his Primeape is going to level me up? Well, the answer is, no it's not, so I'm going to have to face the Polyrath without Wing Attack. However, I'm more than twice as fast as it, so I have a chance to flinch with Headbutt. On the first turn, it goes for Mind Reader, and then on the second turn, we have a very fun interaction. It uses Hypnosis, and despite the fact that it just set up Mind Reader, this move misses. So, what happened here? Well, in Generation 2, all moves that cause non-volatile status conditions, so Hypnosis or Thunder Wave, have a 25% chance to miss when the AI uses them. If, for example, the AI uses a move like Lock On or Mind Reader and then uses one of these moves, that chance to miss is not changed. So that's why Hypnosis was able to miss. By the way, this 25% debuff does not apply to a move like Confuse Ray, because Confusion is a volatile status condition. By the way, non-volatile status conditions show up with a little icon in the game, and they also persist when the battle ends, whereas volatile status conditions do not show up and they do not persist after the battle ends. Alright, so with Chuck out of the way, I now have Wing Attack, 
attack, and I also have fly. So it's interesting to me that Charizard has the chance to learn either one of these moves at this point. Because fly has less than 100% accuracy and it takes two turns, I am not going to be using it for this playthrough. I'm just going to stick with wing attack. However, I'm obviously going to use fly to travel around the map. I'm going to pick up some important items now. The pink bow, a rare candy in Violet City, a PP up in Violet City, a rare candy south of Goldenrod City, and then the soft sand after defeating these three cool trainers. With them out of the way, it is time to face the red Gyarados. By the way, you cannot run away from this battle, so you do need to defeat it or catch it. I think that in this case, defeating it is the fastest way to proceed. After all, it is fairly hard to catch. I take care of the rocket plotline, which we all do not need to sit through, and after that, I head into the Mahogany Town Gym to face Price. So the ice type gym leader leads with a water type Pokemon, obviously that makes a lot of sense. It's a bit annoying for Charizard because I do not have an electric type move to counter this thing, but wing attack still does enough damage to knock it out in a single turn. Next is dugong, it takes neutral damage from flamethrower, but it just barely doesn't do enough. However, this ice water type Pokemon actually knows no water type moves, so it's kind of the case where like Price has type diversity, but it doesn't really matter because it only has normal and ice type moves. I finish it off, move on to the Piloswine. As I said before, ground type does not resist fire type moves, so Flamethrower does super effective damage, and with that, I've earned myself technically the seventh badge. This one gives a boost to my special attack, but not my special defense. This is because of a glitch. I think that Charizard has high enough special attack that later on in the playthrough, we might actually see the special defense boost happen. But for the next part of the playthrough, I'm going to have lower special defense. However, that doesn't really matter because Jasmine is next, and I can just sweep her entire team with Flamethrower. Now, the Steelix of all of her Pokemon has the highest chance to survive. It has the most HP as well as the highest special defense. It also knows Rock Throw, which it very rarely uses. However, in this case, Flamethrower just one hits, so Charizard has now earned itself technically the sixth badge, and with this one comes a boost to my defense stat. But before we move on with Charizard's playthrough, let's see how Typhlosion fares in this section of the game. Against Chuck, we can see the impacts of not having access to Flamethrower. Fire Punch has to two hit the Primeape, and as a result, it takes some chip damage before I knock his lead out. Next is Polyrath. Now, Thunder Punch gives me more reliable damage against this thing. However, even with the Magnet, I do not do enough to knock it out in one hit. Polyrath strikes back with Surf. It does a lot of damage, but not enough to get a one hit. I don't even think it would if it got a critical hit. And so, I defeat Chuck on my first attempt. Against Price, Typhlosion has Thunder Punch. It one hits the Seal. And I was hoping that it would one hit the Dugong, but it doesn't. It actually does less damage than Charizard's Flamethrower did. Still, Price is not going to be an issue. Like, maybe the Piloswine will survive Fire Punch. Ah, uh, no, it doesn't. Price is just so bad. I was also wondering if Jasmine's Steelix would survive Fire Punch, but it looks like the answer is no. I assume that both these powerful Fire-type starters are just overkilling all of these Pokémon. So in this case, the difference between Fire Punch and Flamethrower really only mattered against Chuck's Primeape. So now, it is time for the Radio Tower plotline, the most boring section of any Johto playthrough. While I complete this section of the game, we're going to check in with the times just briefly. In the Jasmine split, Typhlosion had a time of 40 minutes and 54 seconds, whereas Charizard had a time of 40 minutes and 3 seconds. So Charizard still retains the lead, but it lost a tiny bit of time. It's only ahead by 51 seconds now. Now in the underground, you might expect that the rival is going to be scary because he does have a Feraligator, and this Pokemon is incredible. I hope all of you are very excited for the next video in this series because I think that this water alligator is going to put out some absolutely incredible results. After all, it is the speedrunner's choice for Generation 2. However, in the hands of the rival, this Pokemon has the intimidating moveset of Rage, Water Gun, Bite, and Scary Face. Yeah, his Feraligator is just terrible. Honestly, sometimes even with Pokemon that are strong against Typhlosion or against Meganium, I feel like going up against those teams is harder, just because this Feraligator is so bad. So Typhlosion obviously has no problems in this fight. With the rocket plotline out of the way, I head through Ice Path and into Claire's Gym. So now let's do the last major battle in Johto. Now unfortunately for both of these fire types, they do not learn Ice Punch, which makes a lot of sense. If you had like fire on your body and you were trying to freeze your fists, it would not work very well. What that means is I need a counter for Claire's Dragonairs. They all know Thunder Wave and they love to spam this move, 
so I'm hoping that by teaching Typhlosion Return in the place of Headbutt and giving the Pink Bow, I am going to guarantee myself a one-hit on all of them. However, after the first one goes down, her AI chooses to send in Kingdra, it goes for Surf, which does almost half to Typhlosion, and then she uses a Hyper Potion, however, this lets me get in two more returns and finish her ace off. Okay, now it's time to see if I'm going to knock the two Dragonairs out with one hit from Return. I take the second one out, and now it's time for her last one. I hit with Return, and it also goes down. Before I head to the league with Typhlosion, let's catch up with Charizard. First of all, I want to mention Petrol, who is an absolute nightmare with Meganium. In this case though, with a powerful fire type move, I can just knock out all of the coughings in a single hit, so he is not an issue. The rival in the underground is predictably easy, and with that, Charizard has also made it to Claire. So I'm going to use the same strategy that Typhlosion used. Return 1 hits the first Dragonair, and now we can see one small difference between the AI. It is going to send in the second Dragonair next, because this one has Thunderbolt, which is super effective against Charizard. That allows me to knock it out, and then she sends in her third Dragonair, which I wasn't really expecting. Honestly, I am not sure why this is the case, because in Generation 2, Ice Beam is not super effective against Charizard, and uh, while Charizard looks like a dragon, it is not a dragon, so Dragon Breath is not super effective. I was expecting her to send in Kingdra, but because she didn't, I just one-shot the Dragonair, and now I move on to the Kingdra. Return does more than half, Kingdra sets up Smoke Screen. Okay, that could be bad. However, Claire doesn't decide to use a potion, my next return hits, and with that, I've finished Claire off. This does give a boost that I very rarely talk about, a 12.5% boost to dragon type moves. It could be useful for Charizard, after all, dragon moves are super effective against Lance's dragons, so hold on to that idea for later, maybe it will come into play. For now though, both of these fire types have to defeat the rival in Victory Road. For Typhlosion, I'm going to do play by play of this battle just so you know how easy the rival is. Um, fire Punch, one hits the Sneasel, after that it's for Alligator time, I knock it out with a single Thunder Punch. This levels Typhlosion up to level 50, Golbat's next, Thunder Punch 1 hits, as you would expect, and now I've had the chance to learn Earthquake, so I can use this against the Haunter for a 1 hit, against the Kadabra for another 1 hit, and then finally against the Magneton for a 6th 1 hit in a row. Yeah, the rival is really bad. And for Charizard, it is a little bit different. That is, only in the fact that I have to use Return on the Feraligator to get a 2 hit. Remember, this Feraligator still only knows Water Gun. It does have Slash, which I guess is okay, but it doesn't help it at all in this matchup. Note that here I did not teach Charizard Earthquake. I don't really like using this move before the League if I can prevent it or if I think I don't have better options, so I'm just going with Dig. Still, Flamethrower is more than enough for Charizard to get through the fight without a reset. I won't hit everything except the Feraligator, so no problems at all. So now that both Pokémon are prepared, let's take on the Elite Four. Let's see how Charizard does against Will. Return just doesn't quite have enough damage to knock the first Zatu out, and as a result, Charizard gets confused. Luckily, I don't hit myself on the next turn, and I knock his lead out for free. Next, he sends in Slowbro, I assume because it's a water type, but it doesn't actually know any water type moves. I snap out of confusion, hit a massive critical hit with Return, and then knock the Slowbro out on the next turn. Alright, it is time to face his ace, Zatu. I assume he is saving the Jinx and the Executor because they are weak to my fire-type moves. However, unlike the first Zatu, I get my second critical hit in this battle and knock his ace out in one hit. Okay, so now all that's left is the Executor and the Jinx. I accidentally mistimed my inputs here and used Wing Attack against the Executor instead of Flamethrower. It just barely survives as a result, sets up Reflect, and I knock it out on the next turn. And then I make another truly baffling play by not choosing Flamethrower against the Jinx. I'm using Return. I don't know why I was doing this. I was probably just tired. <laughs> Anyways. Will was no problem at all, so let's move on to Koga. Wing Attack 1 hits the Ariados, Flamethrower 2 hits the Muck even though it used Minimize. Crobat is next, and while it does set up Double Team, I hit with 3 Flamethrowers and finish it off. Okay, so now it's time for the easiest Pokemon on his team, Fortress, which takes 4 times damage from Flamethrower. All that's left is Venomoth, of course this thing is a Water Rock type, so I do need to be careful, but luckily Flamethrower does enough damage and Koga is no more. 
Okay, so Bruno. I don't expect a lot from him when I have a Pokemon that is a flying type. However, I should note that both the Onix and the Machamp do know Rock Slide. And then, against the Rock-type Pokemon, I accidentally misclick using Wing Attack. I actually thought he was going to send his Machamp out next, because it's very often that he sends out his Onix last. Obviously, I was not thinking things through here. As a result of my misplay, Charizard gets hit by Rock Slide, which takes it down under half health. On the next turn, I knock the Onix out. Then Bruno sends in Hitmonchan, I assume because it has Thunder Punch, but I just one-shot it with Wing Attack, and now it's time for his ace, Machamp. If it survives Wing Attack and hits Rock Slide, I am definitely going to lose. So will it? And the answer is yes, it does survive on like the smallest sliver of health. It strikes back with Rock Slide, and Charizard gets its first reset because of my misplay. When I just knock the Onix out in a single hit, I make it back to the Machamp with green health. Wing Attack once again does not get the KO. Charizard gets hit by Rock Slide again, so let's see if it's going to survive at this amount of health. And the answer is yes, but just barely. I only have 18 hit points left over. Bruno uses a Max Potion next, so I get to re-roll Wing Attack, and this time I knock the Machamp out in a single hit, so it looks like it is possible there. I'm just going to have to be very careful about this fight in my next playthrough. All that's left is Hitmonlee. This thing has nothing that's good against me, so I finish it off with a single Wing Attack and move on to Karen's Chamber. Here, I think it is time to finally upgrade Dig to Earthquake. Probably should have done that before the Koga fight. I would have had a little bit of a better time against the Muck. Up first on Karen's team is Umbreon, and this thing takes less than half from return, retaliates with Sand Attack, lowering Charizard's accuracy, and then I reroll return, hoping for better damage, but I don't get it. However, Umbreon only uses Faint Attack, which is much better than it trying to stack Sand Attack again, and I knock her lead out. Next is Gengar. I have Earthquake for this thing so that it's not going to use Destiny Bond or Curse against me. And with it out of the way, I think the fight is going to get much easier. I one hit the Murkrow with Return, one hit the Houndoom with Earthquake, and after that, all that's left is Vileplume, which I easily one shot with Wing Attack. So Charizard has made it to the champion. But first, we have to see how Typhlosion will do with the Elite Four. Against Will, Thunder Punch is very helpful because I have super effective damage against all the Pokemon Charizard sort of struggled against. I one hit the first Zatu, the Slowbro, the Ace Zatu, and then Fire Punch one hits the Executor, as well as the Jinx. Okay, so we're quickly proceeding to Koga. Here I can use Fire Punch on the Ariados and the Fortress. Not sure why he sent that out second. Then Earthquake for the Muck. Then he sends in Crobat, which is going to set up double team, and I have to use Fire Punch to knock it out. I also miss once, so this is taking a little bit longer than I would have liked. After that is the Mono Water type Venomoth. Of course, Fire Punch gets the one hit, and now we're moving on to Bruno. This is the first trainer in the league that Typhlosion's moveset isn't as good as Charizard's against. However, Charizard's main weakness to Bruno is the fact that Rock Slide does 4 times damage, but with Typhlosion, it's only going to do 2 times damage, so I'm not actually that worried here. Also, the Machamp just misses Rock Slide, so I knock it out for free. After that, Bruno only has Hitmonlee and Hitmonchan, both of which are easy to clean up for Typhlosion, and with that, I have made it to Karen with no resets. However, if you've watched my videos before, I'm sure you'll know that she's usually the trainer to dish out the first reset. So I'm worried that that's going to be the case for Typhlosion. However, things start off really well for me because I get a critical hit against the Umbreon, and I knock it out in two hits. I don't think that would have happened if I didn't get the crit. Next is Gengar. I go for Earthquake to one-shot it. And now I am starting to feel much more confident. Thunder Punch one hits the Murkrow. I can use Earthquake against the Houndoom. However, it misses because of Sand Attack, so I get hit by Crunch, but it doesn't do that much, and I finish her ace off on the next turn. Okay, so it does not look like Typhlosion is going to get its first reset here. I finish the Vile Plume off, and with that, the Johto Starter has also made it to Lance. I think we need to dedicate a good amount of time to Lance's team, because both of the fire starters don't really have anything that's good against him. While Typhlosion does have Thunder Punch for the Gyarados, after that, its prospects are not that good. All of his Pokemon in Generation 2 are flying types, so Earthquake will do nothing. The Dragonites resist both fire and electric moves, so really my best choice here is return for most of these Pokemon. Obviously, I can use Thunder Punch against the Aerodactyl as well as the Charizard. However, what I'm really worried about is the fact that I'm not going to one-hit the Dragonites. 
Maybe I'll even have to three hit them, and that means that one of the first two will be able to paralyze Typhlosion with Thunder Wave. Luckily for me, the first one misses because of the AI debuff, and I move on to the second one. However, here I get paralyzed, hit by Hyper Beam, which does about a third, and then I knock the Dragonite out. Okay, time for the Charizard. It moves first, hitting Slash, and I one-hit it with Thunder Punch. All right, so Typhlosion might actually do it despite the status condition. I have made it to Lance's final Dragonite. It moves first, hitting Outrage. Paralysis prevents me from moving. It hits another Outrage, taking Typhlosion down to 18 hit points, and Return does less than half. Okay, so this is the Johto Starter's first reset. And I really don't want to mess around here, I need to two hit that last Dragonite, so I'm going to use Rare Candies to take Typhlosion from level 54 all the way up to level 58. This is so I'm over two damage rounding thresholds. I'm fairly sure that that is going to be the right level. Okay, so let's do this fight again. I one hit the Gyarados, one hit the Aerodactyl, two shot the first Dragonite. By the way, I used a Paralyzed Cure Berry here, so I'm at least going to make it to the second Dragonite without a status condition. However, the second one does paralyze me. I move on to the Charizard, X accidentally select Fire Punch, doing less than half. Luckily though, Charizard used Hyper Beam, so I am able to knock it out on the next turn as if I knocked it out in one turn. Alright, so I've made it back to Lance's Ace. Let's see if I can two hit the Dragonite. I go for Return and ah, oh, it did less than half damage. It actually looks like I did less damage than my previous attempt. So what probably happened is I got a good roll last time and a bad roll this time. However, I also get good luck in this fight in another way, which is Paralysis doesn't prevent my second return. However, this one doesn't do enough damage to finish the Dragonite off either. Okay, so that's going to be a second loss. Unless Typhlosion survives Outrage on three hit points. Okay, Paralysis, please don't mess this up for me. It doesn't. Typhlosion hits return and Lance's ace goes down. That was so close. I can't believe that Typhlosion won there. I definitely am going to need a solution for this fight in my second playthrough. So now, let's see how Charizard does against Lance. Well, things here are theoretically much worse. The reason is, is that the Gyarados has super effective damage against me, and it can also set up the rain, cutting fire-type moves power. Things should stack up the same against the first two Dragonites, except I don't two-hit the second one, which is quite bad. And from here, things are going to get even worse, because Lance has an illegal Aerodactyl. By the way, there is no way for the player to obtain one of these with Rock Slide, but Lance's has that move. And yeah, Flamethrower, the move that has the highest effective power, does less than half to Aerodactyl. It hits Rock Slide, and it does so much damage to Charizard, taking me down to red health. Because Flamethrower is doing less than half, I'm not able to knock it out on the next turn. Luckily, Rock Slide has trash accuracy, so it doesn't hit me and I do finish the Aerodactyl off. But with so little health left over and no super effective damage against Lance's Charizard, my Charizard gets its second reset. Alright, so I was playing this Charizard playthrough second, and after that result I figured I should mirror Typhlosion's approach and use four rare candies to take Charizard up to level 58. The thing is though, this is a really bad fight for Charizard. Like, I can use the Paralyzed Cure Berry, and I can knock the Dragonites out in two hits now, which is great, but I'm most likely still going to arrive at the Aerodactyl with a status condition and no way to deal good damage to it. Rock Slide is doing more than half to Charizard, in this case it just flinches me, and as a result, I don't even get to attack the prehistoric Pokemon. Now in the first fight, I actually got good luck because the Dragonite missed Hyper Beam, but in this case it doesn't, so I'm arriving at the Aerodactyl slightly bruised. So what I think I'm waiting for here is Rock Slide to miss, and for me to not be paralyzed so that I can actually knock the Aerodactyl out. However, I think that it is going to have to miss two Rock Slides in a row, because if it doesn't, I have red health left over for the Charizard, and I'm not going to outspeed or knock this thing out in a single hit. And now I want all of you to focus on this fight because it's very important to watch. The first Dragonite attempts to paralyze me, but misses because of the AI debuff. Then the second one paralyzes me, but I cure it with the Paralyzed Cure Berry so that I arrive at the Aerodactyl faster than it. This allows me to do more than half with Flamethrower without taking any damage. Rock Slide hits, it does more than half, but I survive and knock it out. Alright, this is the first time I've had orange health for the Charizard. I go for Return, it does more than half, Charizard hits Wing Attack, my Charizard survives on red health, and I finish the Charizard off for the first time. However, here's the thing. I have talked about how arriving at the Charizard with red health was a problem, and yeah, that is still a problem even if I make it to the Dragonite. 
I go for return, it does less than half, and Dragonite strikes back with Outrage, knocking Charizard out. Okay, so I think I need a different strategy. I need to do more than half to the Dragonite, so I'm going to use two more rare candies to go up to level 60. And in addition to that, I think I need a new move set. So, let's teach Charizard the move that I always forget, Dragon Breath. In this case, I'm going to teach it in the place of Wing Attack. After all, I can use Fly as a substitute for that move later on, but flying moves are not particularly good in Kanto anyways. What I'm hoping for here is that by leveraging Charizard's special attack stat, because dragon moves are special in Generation 2, I will be able to do more damage to Lance's Dragonites. Maybe I'm going to get a one hit, however I doubt that, and in this case the Dragonite does survive with red health. However, I do now have a chance to paralyze the Dragonites, which is much better. Unfortunately for me though, Charizard keeps getting resets. It gets one here, and then another one here to the Aerodactyl because it does so much damage with Rock Slides still. So it looks like what I need is a perfect fight where I arrive at the Aerodactyl with full health. This allows me to survive the Rock Slide with decent orange health. Then I can shrug off Charizard's attack and make it back to Lance's final Dragonite. Okay, I am really hoping that I'm just going to survive one outrage here. I go for Dragon Breath, and it does massive damage because of a lucky critical hit. With that, I finish Lance's ace off, and now Charizard can finally proceed to Kanto. So now let's compare the results so far. Typhlosion beat Lance with a time of 1 hour, 4 minutes, and 8 seconds, whereas Charizard beat Lance with a time of 1 hour, 6 minutes, and 33 seconds. So while Charizard was in the lead all the way until after Karen, Typhlosion took the lead because of its move set against Lance, whereas Charizard struggled because of its typing as well as its move set. However, it is very often the case that Johto playthroughs come down exclusively to the last two trainers. So let's skip ahead and face Blue in Viridian City. I think most of you are probably going to be looking at the Rhydon and thinking that this is going to be a significant problem for Charizard. Here's the thing though, Blue's AI is like really unfair to this thing. While it does no Rock Slide and it would likely KO Charizard, the AI is just going to prioritize using Sandstorm on the first turn, giving me two hits to knock it out. After that I do have to face a Gyarados, but this Pokemon also loves to set up weather on the first turn, once again giving me two hits to knock it out, and from there, things are going to be much easier. I one hit the Alakazam, next Blue sends in Arcanine, I go for Earthquake, just barely not knocking it out. However, after surviving an extreme speed, Blue gets locked into trying to heal this thing with full restores. He does get in one more extreme speed because it has priority before I knock it out, but all he has left is an Executor, and of course Flamethrower gets the one hit. So Typhlosion is going to do better against Blue, after all it has Thunder Punch for the Gyarados. And against the Rhydon, I want to show another weird quirk of this AI. He isn't always going to set up Sandstorm. In some cases, he will choose Fury Attack instead of Rock Slide or Earthquake. Ah, oh, so frustrating. I always kind of default to the thought that the AI is awful in Generation 1 and much better in Generation 2 and 3, but the more I play these games, the more I realize the early generations of Pokemon all have really strange broken AI quirks. Anyways, in this case, it just gives Typhlosion an easy victory, and with that, both Pokemon have cleared the second last battle of the game. However, before I face Red, I'm going to use the remaining rare candies to take Typhlosion all the way up to level 72. Alright, so let's see how Typhlosion does against the ultimate in-game challenge. First is Pikachu, and I have Earthquake for it. I secure a one-hit and move on to Red's second Pokémon, which is Espeon. Here I used Earthquake because I wanted a physical move. The Espeon has much more special defense. It does more than half. Espeon hits with Psychic, and I knock it out with Return on the next turn. Okay, so now it is time to face the Blastoise. Luckily, I have Thunder Punch. It does what looks like half. However, I might not roll the same amount of damage on the next turn, but in this case I do, so I knock the Blastoise out in only two hits. With it out of the way, it's time to face what is usually Red's most powerful Pokemon, Snorlax. What I'm really hoping here is that I am going to be able to three hit with Return. After the first two hits, I wasn't sure that I was in range to knock it out. However, Typhlosion gets a critical hit, taking it down. Up next is the Charizard, which isn't too scary because I can take it out with two hits from Thunder Punch. While I only have red health left over, all that's remaining is the Venusaur, 
and Flamethrower gets the one hit. So Typhlosion clocks in with a time of 1 hour 21 minutes and 44 seconds, with one reset at level 73. This took 5 hours and 14 minutes of game time. So unfortunately for Charizard, it looks like it is going to be slightly slower than Typhlosion. However, I'm hoping that it's going to similarly beat Red on the first attempt so that it doesn't lose any additional time. Against Pikachu, I just go for a Flamethrower. It's going to one-hit. This thing is very weak. After that, Red sends in Blastoise. I think that maybe he sent the Espeon in second with Typhlosion because it has Mud Slap, which is technically super effective. But then when he rolled damages, he saw that Psychic did more damage and chose that move anyways. However, in this case, Blastoise is the best choice because Charizard is a flying type. Against it, I'm going to have to use Return and... Oh no, that did, like, less than a third? I am really worried now. As I explained before, all the Pokémon that have weather moves love to set them up, so the Blastoise goes for this first turn, boosting the power of water-type moves. My return does not knock it out. Blastoise goes for Surf, and it deals massive damage. However, Charizard does survive with 39 hit points, and I go for one more return, but of course Blastoise survives. Okay, so I need a way to counter Rain Dance, and if I teach Charizard Sunny Day, then I can take away the rain and also cut the power of Water-type moves. Because I'm faster than the Blastoise, I have to use Return on the first turn, and then after it sets up Rain Dance, I can use Sunny Day to take away the rain. Then the turtle uses Surf, and then I cannot tell you how disappointed I was in how much damage this did. It does more than half, even when the sun is on the field. Well, that was because of a critical hit. But maybe, just maybe, I will roll better damage and be able to three hit the Blastoise. Not in this fight, apparently. It survives with a sliver and knocks Charizard out. Okay, so let's head back to the department store and pick up some more vitamins, just to improve Charizard's chances just a little bit. After that, in Mount Silver, I do a tiny bit of training, taking Charizard up to level 69. And this is nice because then with my rare candies, I can get to the next damage rounding threshold at level 73. Okay, please tell me that this is going to give me the three hit on the Blastoise. Once again, I'm using the Sunny Day strategy. Blastoise's Surf does about a quarter. I have to repeat the Sunny Day strategy again to mitigate the rain. And now it's time to see, do I have enough damage to knock it out? And I do. All right, I'm feeling much better about this fight as a result. I one-shot the Espeon with Flamethrower. Next is Snorlax. I decide to go for Flamethrower on the first turn just because I have the sun on my side. It does more than half. And then I use Earthquake followed with Return to three hit it. Oh, I, uh, I guess just barely not. Snorlax wakes up, hits Body Slam, takes Charizard down to two hit points. Ah, oh, great, it paralyzes me. Okay, so Snorlax moves first and Charizard faints. Okay, so I don't really need an Earthquake for this battle. What if I teach Rest in its place? Then when I make it back to the Snorlax, which I do in the very next fight, then I will be able to heal and play a little bit more conservatively. However, funnily enough, I got seduced by the HP bar. I thought I was doing more damage with Return because of good rolls, so I was like, ah, I'm just gonna knock it out. But no, I'm not. I'm not gonna knock it out. The Snorlax is going to knock me out. However, in the next fight, I am able to finally take the Snorlax out and move on to the Charizard. I didn't even need rest there, but uh, maybe I need rest now? Because I'm gonna have to use Return to knock the Charizard out. It does less than half. Charizard hits Wing Attack, taking my Charizard down to 9 hit points. I go for Return, praying for a better damage roll, but I don't get it. So that is the 12th reset for Charizard, and I am now over 1 hour and 30 minutes into this playthrough. I wanted the answer to be rest for the Charizard, but this time I arrive with more health, and that allows me to just finish it off without ever using rest, so once again this move is useless. I make it to the Venusaur, here I was fairly convinced that Flamethrower would one-shot, and in this case, it does. So finally, the Cantonian starter clocks in. It gets a time of 1 hour 32 minutes and 22 seconds, with 12 resets at level 73. This took 5 hours and 22 minutes of game time. So Typhlosion came out on top by a staggering 10 minutes and 38 seconds. However, maybe with some finesse and optimization, Charizard will be able to unleash its hidden power and defeat Typhlosion in the second playthrough. But before that, let's see how the native Johto starter does with the game. The major update that I'm making in the early game is that I'm going to skip Sprout Tower and head to Faulkner right away. Doing this with Typhlosion does create some risk, and that's just because I'm not going to have a guaranteed one hit on the first Pidgey. And it has a chance of using Mudslap against me, but luckily I have a 76% chance to knock it out, and in this case, I get it. After that, because the Pidgeotto is only going to use Gust, Typhlosion has secured the win. So you'd have to get very unlucky there with accuracy in order to lose. 
The next portion of the game is really easy for fire types. Bugsy is weak to them, and then the rival in Azalea Town only has a Croconaw, and this thing's quite bad as I've explained before. So I take easy victories here. Then once I make it to Whitney, my moveset has dramatically improved. I do want to note that for this second playthrough, I'm going to be using the same moveset that I used for my first playthrough with Typhlosion, with one small update later on. Having access to the coverage moves I need gives me an easy victory over the rival in Burned Tower. And then against Morty, I want to talk about damage ranges. I have guaranteed one hits on his three weak Pokemon, and a guaranteed two hit on the Gengar. However, in this case, I get a critical hit, so I knock it out in one turn. I do also want to note that I have a 50% to knock it out, and that does include the chance to critical hit. So yeah, Typhlosion is easily going to take a victory in this battle. The Mint Berry makes Chuck trivial. Thunder Punch really helps against Rice, as well as Fire Punch on the Piloswine, and then I can Fire Punch my way through Jasmine, and against her I do want to note that I have a guaranteed one hit on the Steelix. Now as I do some item management, I just want to mention Hidden Power because for this playthrough I'm going into it with Hidden Power Ice. Overall this is the best Hidden Power type to use in Johto, after all it counters both Claire and Lance, and it also doesn't mess with your HP DV too much. If you didn't know, in Generation 2, your HP DV is calculated based on your other DVs. So if you have even DVs in your other stats, it actually negatively impacts your HP DV. And in the case of Hidden Power Ice, you have all odd values. So that gives you a maxed HP DV. In my opinion, the second best type of Hidden Power is Hidden Power Ground because it provides so much coverage in Johto. However, this does give you 12 in your attack DV, which reduces your HP DV down to 7. So that's why I try to prioritize Hidden Power Ice. Now I spent all this time talking about the move, but I'm not actually going to use it against Claire. If I had to choose a mistake in this playthrough, I think this would be it. The reason I didn't want to teach it is because I want all four of these moves throughout the league. However, the consequence is that I only have a 38% chance to one-hit Claire's Dragonairs. Yes, this is the damage range even when Typhlosion is holding the pink bow. What this exposes me to is the risk of Thunder Wave. However, I'm not too worried about this, and that's because of how Claire's AI worked. In the first playthrough, I mentioned that I wasn't sure why she changed her ordering when I was using a Charizard. So I contacted Wile, who does a lot of programming for me, and we looked into the code and figured it out. When the AI is selecting which Pokemon it should send out next, it checks type matchups, like it did in Generation 1. So in the case I'm using Charizard, it looks at all the Dragonairs and goes, Thunder Wave, that's an electric move, it's super effective against the flying type. So she chooses to send out all the Dragonairs in order, and then Kingdra last. Whereas with Typhlosion, only the first Dragonair has Surf, and then the other two do not have any moves that are super effective. So the AI sees that Kingdra has Surf and sends it in second. Essentially what I don't want to have happen is be paralyzed by the first Dragonair, and that's less likely to happen because it can also use Surf against me. After that, I can knock the Kingdra out in two hits, and then sweep through the final two Dragonairs, being much less worried about paralysis. Alright, so I think that we all know that Typhlosion is not going to struggle in the league. It sweeps through Will, Koga, and Bruno with relative ease. After that though, I do want to make an update to how I'm playing the game, because Karen is very scary, so to prepare for her as well as Lance, I'm going to use 6 rare candies to take Typhlosion up from level 52 to level 58. At this level, I have a guaranteed 2 hit on the Umbreon, and guaranteed 1 hits on all of her other Pokemon. The only way that I can lose this fight is if the Sand Attack causes me to miss at a critical time, and I would have to miss multiple times just because of how little damage her Pokemon can deal to Typhlosion. So with that, we are moving on to Lance, and here is where I'm going to teach Hidden Power in the place of Fire Punch. After all, Fire-type moves are very useless against Lance, and I'm going to get access to Flamethrower very soon in just two levels at level 60. Alright, so I want everyone to check out this dominant performance. I one-shot the Gyarados with Thunder Punch, one-shot the Aerodactyl with Thunder Punch, one-shot both of his first two Dragonites with Hidden Power Ice, then Charizard comes out, I one-shot it with Thunder Punch, and finally, I one-shot his Ace Dragonite with Hidden Power Ice. So, Typhlosion is off towards Kanto, and let's jump right into the battle against Blue. As I said before, I've learned Flamethrower in the place of Hidden Power Ice now, because I only plan to use that move against Lance. And here I just want to make a note, which I find really refreshing. Neither Typhlosion nor Charizard is going to have to utilize Curse or Sleep Talk. I guess in this case they are using the punches, but it's nice for me to see no curse strategies used against the final two trainers in the game in one of my Generation 2 videos. 
However, I am going to add one more staple to my moveset before I face red, and that is rest in the place of earthquake. I can do this because I know that I'm going to one-shot the Pikachu with Flamethrower, and from there I just have an answer for everything on his team. I can use Flamethrower to two-shot the Espeon, after that is Blastoise, which I can two-hit with Thunder Punch, and I know it's going to use Rain Dance on the first turn because I have enough health. As a result, I get to the Snorlax with full health, and here I use Flamethrower on the first turn, so I don't do enough damage to put it in range to heal with Rest after my second return. Also using Flamethrower on the first turn gives me the chance to burn it, which would minimize its damage. I knock it out with three uses of return, move on to the Charizard, which I can use Thunder Punch against. In case this gets scary, I could always use Rest here, but today I don't have to, and I finish the Venusaur off with two hits from Flamethrower. And Typhlosion clocks in with an incredible final time of 1 hour, 16 minutes, and 30 seconds, with zero resets at level 72. This took 5 hours and 1 minute of game time. Now, these are incredible results. However, it is 14 seconds slower than Celebi, so today, Typhlosion earns itself the third spot in my tier list. Yes, right now it has better results than Ho-Oh, but I do need to redo that legendary bird so that I can take out Sprout Tower and improve its time a little bit. However, I have a theory that Ho-Oh is not actually going to be faster than Typhlosion just because it's the slow growth rate. At long last it is time, let's get into the final playthrough with Charizard and see if this thing can earn itself some redemption. For this playthrough, I'm going to go with Hidden Power Ice once again, but this is a much bigger change for Charizard than it was for Typhlosion. And we have to get to the mid game for me to explain that, so I'm just going to briefly mention that the early game for Charizard is essentially the same as it was for Typhlosion. I cut out Sprout Tower, saving myself some time, and then I speed through all of the first three gyms, and with the Kimono Girls defeated, I am off towards the Lake of Rage to pick up Hidden Power as soon as is possible. I want to teach this move to Charizard right away because it is really going to help throughout the mid game. I should also mention that going and picking up Hidden Power actually gave Charizard a little bit more experience before Morty, and what this does is give me level 33 instead of level 32. Because this is a level that is good for damage rounding, I have a guaranteed one hit on all of Morty's Pokemon. So I take an easy victory over him, giving Charizard enough experience to level up to level 34 where it learns Flamethrower in the place of Fire Punch. Now I thought about doing a little bit of extra training before Chuck or using a rare candy, just so that I could get access to Wing Attack. However, on final analysis, I really want to keep my rare candies for later on in the game, and I also don't really need Wing Attack here. With the Mint Berry, I can wake up from one use of Hypnosis, and I can also knock out the Polyrath in three hits with Headbutt, which is pretty good, and I'm probably going to get one flinch, after all it is a 30% chance. After that, I steamroll through Price, as well as Jasmine, and then I make it to Claire. Now, I have been using Hidden Power to knock out a lot of random NPCs Pokemon, but this is the first time it's useful for Charizard in a major fight. It gives me one hits on all three of the Dragonairs, which are coming out in succession due to my typing. That way I can guarantee that I'm making it to the Kingdra without being hit by a status condition. Now here, there is actually a chance that Charizard loses, I can't believe I'm saying that. There is a 0.48% chance that with a critical hit from Surf, the Kingdra will knock Charizard out. So basically it needs to get the best damage roll it can with Surf and also get a critical hit at the same time, and no, that is not going to happen in this playthrough, so Charizard defeats all of the Johto gyms with zero resets. So now let's check in with the splits between these two playthroughs as I fight the rival before the league. Typhlosion beat Claire at a time of 48 minutes and 57 seconds, whereas Charizard beat Claire at a time of 49 minutes and 9 seconds. Typhlosion is only 12 seconds ahead. So will my preparation with Charizard allow me to get through the league without having any setbacks? Well, let's find out. Against Will, that's certainly the case, because Hidden Power Ice gives me a little bit more damage against his Zatus. Against Koga, uh, Flamethrower is just really good. I don't even need Earthquake for this fight, like I thought about using it, but I'd rather have Flamethrower return, Wing Attack, and Hidden Power, as well as not teaching a new move just to save a little bit of time. And then contrasting Typhlosion's approach, I'm going to use 6 Rare Candies now on Charizard to take it up to level 58 before my fight against Bruno. Without these Rare Candies, I have guaranteed one hits on all of his Pokemon except the Machamp, and against it, I have a 66% chance to knock it out in one hit from Wing Attack. So obviously, if I use the Rare Candies, then I get guaranteed one hits on all of his Pokemon, and then there is no chance that he can hit me with Rock Slide. This also gives me a higher level for Karen, which greatly stabilizes the fight. I know I'm not using Earthquake here, but that's just because I don't need it. So now, let's proceed to Lance. 
And this fight is so much more consistent with Charizard now that it has Hidden Power Ice. I can knock out the Dragonites in one hit, meaning they can't use Thunder Wave, and as a result, I'm able to make it all the way to the Charizard without taking any damage. Now I don't have a one hit on this thing, so I'm going to have to knock it out over two turns, and it does get a critical hit with Hyper Beam, but even in the best case scenario for it, it does less than half, and I have a guaranteed one hit on his final Dragonite, so Charizard takes an easy victory. After the leak, it has actually improved its result in comparison with Typhlosion. It is now only 7 seconds behind. However, I don't have good news about the next major battle against Blue. And that's because Charizard doesn't really have a good answer for Gyarados. Typhlosion had Thunder Punch, however in this case I'm going to have to use Sunny Day to remove the rain so that Gyarados's Hydro Pump doesn't deal massive damage. Now this is pretty consistent against the Gyarados, I tested this fight quite a bit. The only issue is that it takes more time, because I'm constantly using moves that aren't knocking his Pokemon out and giving Charizard immediate progress with the playthrough. And as a result, coming out of this split, Charizard has lost some time, it is now 22 seconds behind Typhlosion. And that is very bad news for it, because against Red, I do not have Thunder Punch, and this is a huge flaw against Red's Blastoise. So I have to take things slow here once again, utilizing the Sunny Day strategy to mess up its rain dances and minimize damage from Surf. By the time his following Espeon has come out, Charizard is not in the greatest place because it's taken a lot of damage. However, I get a lucky critical hit here and knock the Espeon out in one hit. Next is Snorlax, and because the sun is on my side, Flamethrower does half. After that, I can use Return and knock it out in two hits, just barely surviving its one body slam. And here is where everything falls apart for Charizard. In the mirror match, I have to use Rest because I'm actually going to have to three hit the Charizard. It takes me a while to gain back all of the health that I need and get three hits in to knock Red's Charizard out and this costs my Charizard a lot of time. By the time I knock out the grass type, Charizard clocks in with a time of 1 hour, 17 minutes, and 45 seconds. It did have zero resets, and it finished the game at level 72, which is the same as Typhlosion. This took 5 hours and 4 minutes of game time. So, comparing their results, these two Pokemon are incredibly close. It was actually very exciting in the second playthrough when I thought Charizard might just do it. However, in the end, I think two small details made Charizard slightly worse. The first one being the order the AI chooses to send its Pokemon out in, and Charizard just lacks coverage against water types, which Typhlosion has. So while the flying type is helpful for the ground immunity, in the end, it just doesn't help the way the Thunder Punch does. However, Charizard's results are still outstanding, and it earns itself the fifth overall spot in my Johto tier list. Now I just want to make an adjustment here. The way I film these videos is sometimes asynchronous. I have a spreadsheet that I collect all the playthrough data in, and there, I didn't adjust my thresholds for the tiers, but I was just like randomly doing some work, I think on a Saturday afternoon, right before I went on vacation, and I updated the times that it takes to get into each one of the tiers on this graphic in the Photoshop document. So when I was ranking Venusaur and recording the script for that portion of the video last week, I just said that Venusaur earns itself a spot in the S tier. However, many of you noted that the S tier seems to be Pokemon that have a time under an hour and 20 minutes, which Venusaur did not get. So yeah, we're demoting Venusaur today to the A tier because I have to change those thresholds in my spreadsheet. Keeping track of all these files and all the data is really hard. A lot of it is done manually. I wish I could just automate the creation of these tier lists with some script or something like that, but in the end I think writing that script would actually take more time, so I apologize when small errors like this crop up. Now, I want to mention that these two fire type starters got results that were very close together. Typhlosion outperformed Charizard in both time metrics, but only slightly, whereas Venusaur significantly outperformed Meganium. And the fire type starters as a duo very significantly outperformed the grass type type starters. Just a quick aside on the grass type starters, I also said in that video that it was the first video in Johto that I did with a grass type, and uh, yeah, all the Celebi fans really let me know that that was not the case. <laughs> Anyways, sorry about that again. I took a vacation, and I clearly missed some things in the review process. Okay, so let's get back on track. Next week, I'm going to be doing playthroughs with Blastoise and Feraligator to round out this video trio. I am incredibly excited for that video. Since Feraligator is used as the speedrunning Pokemon of choice in Generation 2, I have really high hopes for it. However, Blastoise is very similar, and the water type is fantastic. Plus, and there are going to be spoilers here uh, for my Kanto starters video, 
video, so just click away now if you don't want those spoilers. I don't know how you wouldn't have seen that video by now though. It has like 300,000 views. Anyway, so spoilers, Blastoise got the best performance in that video, so I also have high hopes for it here in Johto. Like, subscribe, and ring the Chimeco so you're notified when I post new videos. If you support me on Patreon or through YouTube memberships, thank you so much. It means the world to me. Now, if you've made it this far, you're incredible. I'll see you in my next video.